Hello, thank you for tuning in to North Carolina Vietnam Veterans Lessons of Vietnam tonight. We have uh, another guest uh, with us tonight. Uh, call us at 919-518-9773 and uh, ask him questions. Uh, if you don't understand something he says, uh, he is from the northern part of the United States. Uh, you know, he's not a good, true <laughs> southerner. Uh, so if you don't understand something he says, I'm certain that either I can interpret it for you or we get him to repeat it and so forth. Uh, he's from upstate New York. Uh, for those of you from the south, there is an upstate New York. It's not all the city. Uh, as most, most of southerners think that all of New York is New York City. Uh, his name is Ange Carmen. Uh, he's uh, been down here a, a little, for a little while now. He uh, still speaks like, you know, someone from New York. And, uh, you know, from, but he's farther out than Long Island. So, um, Ange, uh, thank you for being here tonight and uh, or, th or this afternoon or whenever you happen to be watching this. And uh, appreciate you uh, coming in and, and visiting with us. And uh, I will have to tell you that I did have uh, another guest tonight, uh, and Ange was supposed to come on the next show. But our guest, uh, Marine Gunny Sergeant, uh, I think he was a Gunny Sergeant, I know he was a sergeant, uh, having some health issues and uh, had to bow out tonight. But uh, we're looking forward to uh, Wayne getting back in good health and coming in. Uh, he's got quite a story to tell. But, Ange, you, uh, where are you from? Tell everybody where you were from and uh, up, up north and, and so forth and a little bit about your how you got started. And well, I, I uh, originally was from a suburb of Utica, New York, called Whitesboro. That's where I went to high school. Um, and after high school, I went to work with my dad for a few years and, about 1965. I mean, what was your what your dad do? My dad was in plumbing and heating, steam fitting, uh, air conditioning. Oh, okay. Okay, and I did my apprenticeship with him. Commercial summers, or residential, or both? Both. 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 Okay. Um, I did my apprenticeship with him um, summers in high school, and then uh, got my journeyman card about two years after I graduated from high school, and worked worked with him, you know, doing. Well, doing just the jobs that we did, you know, we installed mm -hmm. heating systems, we installed steam systems. Um, I was never into the air conditioning. He was. Um, air conditioning to me was always just that that last little ledge that I couldn't quite comprehend sometimes. No. Um, and I worked with him until 1965. Uh, I had graduated from high school in 1960, so there was five years there that you know that I worked with him and. I, for some reason, decided that there had to be more to life than walking around with that silver spoon. So I enlisted in the Army. Um, when I enlisted, I sort of open enlisted. I, there was a field that I wanted to get into, um, and I did the training. I was at Fort Gordon doing my training. Um, got, the, got the training, but never worked at it. Okay, always was That's pretty one step. That's pretty typical military. Yeah, one step advanced. I was at Fort Gordon until 1966. I went to Korea. 1966, I was there until 67. Now, what did you do in Korea? We manned um, a radio relay station for a Hawk missile unit. Okay. Okay. Uh, what was your rank when you were in Korea? I made... Uh, E5 while it was E5 in Korea. I went over as a PFC and made E5. Okay. Okay. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I went over as a Spec 4 okay. and made Sergeant Hard Stripe E5. What was life like in Korea? Primitive but nice. It was peaceful, laid back, you know. Um, there were things in Korea that we just didn't talk about with our families mm -hmm. because Korea was kind of a wide open place. Yes. Okay. Um, duty was good. For the most part, uh, we had our ups and downs. We were pretty close to the DMZ, our missile site was, and we'd go active quite often. Mm -hmm. um, and when we'd go active, everything would just slam shut, and we were restricted to our areas and whatnot. Um, again, it was pretty good duty. We were sitting on top of a mountain and just did our thing. What, was there a town close by, a big we, town? There, no, it wasn't a big town. It was a, the village of Wijambu. Okay. okay, if you ever watched MASH, yeah. they mentioned Wee Jambu and MASH. Okay, okay. It, was, um, it was north of Seoul, or no, yeah, north of Seoul. Um, 
between Seoul and DMZ, and it had, <laughs> there was a place there they called Mickey Mouse Corners. Okay, it was a crossroads where East, West, North, South Road. And back, I, I think it was during the war or shortly after the war, there was a shipment of winter boots that were going north. And they called them Mickey Mouse boots. They were big, great big pack boots, right? And they look, when you put them on, you look like Mickey Mouse. Mm -hmm. Well, somehow two truckloads of them got stolen mm -hmm. and ended up on the black market. So they called that area Mickey Mouse Corners. If it was part of like it was in Vietnam, if you were uh, if you're an American soldier, you could usually buy stuff on the black market, but you could get it through the po but, but through the supply sergeant. Without a doubt. Yeah. <laughs> Without a doubt. Yeah. Because uh, I was wondering how that was in relation to uh, being when we flew through. Uh, Ange went back to Vietnam with us when we just recently went there in uh, let's see March, April, and May, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But uh, I just wondered how that was when you went back to. Uh, well, we, saw, we thought we were going to Seoul, but when we got there, they called it Incheon. Incheon. Uh, but it was the Seoul airport at Incheon. It's kind of... Um, when, when I flew out of... When I flew into Korea and out of Korea, it was in Seoul. Okay. Okay. Um, and it was basically um, pretty... What can I say? It wasn't up to the United States caliber. It was pretty... Yeah. Pretty basic, pretty laid back, you know. Um, what I noticed this time is, you know, the modern buildings. Uh, Korea has advanced tremendously since I was there, just yes. from what well, I've seen. Well, let's just say South Korea has South advanced, Korea. advanced South Korea, uh, greatly. Without a doubt. I mean, they have advanced to the point where they're actually um, an economic power in the world yeah. to this day. All right, now, when you left Korea, where did you go? Went to Germany, and I was 18 months in Germany. And in What Ger year was that? That was in 67. Aha, he got my ticket to Germany. <laughs> yeah, I tell people all the time, I joined the Army to because uh, they told me I could choose my location and my school. I got my school, but I'm still waiting for my ticket to Germany. I know it's been lost in the mail because I know the Army recruiter wouldn't have lied to me. Nah, he wouldn't But you that. probably picked up my ticket instead. <laughs> I went to Germany and got involved with the, um, the 7th Army. That was uh, my major command. Um was in a communications unit and got um, got assigned to a rapid deployment team. In other words, they, they had a saying there, the balloon goes up. Okay, When the balloon went up, it was an alert time. It was basically saying that there was a war going to start. The yeah. communists were going to invade and whatnot. So we'd rush out and put up our communications and uh, get out in the, in the woods and get our communications up and sit there until whoever was going to use the communications, whether it be an RD unit or um, an infantry unit or whoever was going to use that particular uh, site. Yeah, when you said communications, you're talking about telephones, radios, all of it? Uh, no, what we did is was line of sight radio communications, okay? Um, we put up the antennas. We established the communications through the, uh, the transmitters and receivers. The... Our, the outfits that were going to use the communications came in and hooked into our equipment. Mm -hmm. Once they hooked into our equipment, we were done. We left. Okay. They, it was up to them to maintain the systems. Okay, And then when they were all done, we'd go in and rip them all down, pack them back in the trucks. Now the Berlin Wall was up. Oh, yeah, Berlin Wall was up. Um, I did take a trip to Berlin. Um, it was uh, unusual because you had to get on a train. And you had to take a train across the communist bloc areas into West Berlin. I mean, you were in East Germany. The train, it's the only way you could get to West Berlin from West Germany was on this train. Hmm. It, being a GI, it was yeah. pretty much run by the army. Um, and the, the, the experience was something else. I mean, Berlin, uh, West Berlin was in massive reconstruction. They were still rebuilding. This was in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And they were still rebuilding. And if you got close to the wall and looked on the other side, it was pretty dismal on the other side. They weren't doing a lot. They were cleaning up, but they weren't doing a lot of building. You know, the, the buildings that they were putting up were basic Russian square buildings, four walls and a roof. You know. But our basic, uh, our basic job was maintaining our equipment. Uh, when we'd get an alert, off we'd go. And we'd get called at 2 o'clock in the morning. They always told us, keep a duffel bag packed. You're going to get up, get a call, and you're going to have to go out and do this in the middle of the night. 
And for 18 months, basically, that's what I did. You, so you traveled a whole lot. You went to different sites all over Germany? Or? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we were in uh, everywhere from, from uh, Heidelberg all the way south into, into uh, Mannheim, uh, Munich, down into, uh, into the Alps, not far from where Hitler's place was there. Now that sounds like pretty good, uh, pretty good duty. It uh, was fun. It was yeah. fun, but th I had my family with me. I was an NCO, so my family traveled with me. So um, you were married at that time? Yes, married and had my oldest, my oldest daughter. Okay. Um, and being separated from them was a little tough, but for the most part, I was at our duty station for, you know. We were, were you married when you were in Korea? Yeah. Okay. I got married right after basic training. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Uh, my oldest daughter was born while I was in Korea. So now you're in Germany. Uh, was there 18 li months? Li living a pretty good life in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, government quarters. Did you, st you stayed. Uh, you stayed with your family in government quarters. Yep. Okay. Uh, my my ex-wife um, spoke fluent German, so we got along famously on the economy. Mm -hmm. Her grandmother was from Germany, and she had taught her to speak German, and uh, so we got along famously on the economy. You know, I mean, she just uh, we'd go shopping, and I'd just stand back, shut my mouth. Do the work. All right. Now you're in Germany. You're in Germany 18 months. Now 18. what happens? Yeah, I went home on leave for 30 days and back to the other side again, back to the Far East to Vietnam. Okay. I got there in January. Now did you have you had orders when you left Germany for Vietnam? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You ordered your ordered your orders. What did your orders say? Where were you supposed to be in Vietnam? What your orders said? The train. The train. Okay. So when you got, where did you land in Vietnam? Cameron. Cameron Bay, which yeah. was close to the train, I guess. Right. It was uh, 30 clicks, something like okay. that. It was a hop, skip, and a jump. Yeah. Okay. Um, I got there in January of 69. Was that was the, was that middle, was that part of the rainy season? Or um, in January? I can't yeah, remember. It was still, I think it was pretty dry. It was, was hot, it? and we got off that plane, boy, and that, uh, you know, if you remember, you got off the plane, that smell hits you the first oh, thing. And you, listen, that's the one thing that all Vietnam vet veterans have in common was getting off the plane at heat and humidity hitting them and the smell. Yep. We can all remember that smell. Very unique <laughs> yep. smell into itself. Uh, that is the, you know, no matter where you, we say, you know, depending on what your job was, where you were, uh, what year you were there, everybody's story is different except the plane door opening up and the smell of heat coming in. It's, <laughs> that's always the same. Yeah. So I went from there to Nha Trang, and if my whole year in Vietnam had been in Nha Trang, I'd have had no bad remembrances, no bad uh, dreams, no flashbacks, no nightmares. Nha Trang was, was heaven. You had a, would your assignment to a job when you were in Nha Trang? I was in, in logistics. What I did was, was establish communication sites on a map. Uh, for people who are watching who don't know much about the military, tell us what logistics means. Planning. Planning, okay. Planning. Um, what we did was, uh, say, um, 75th Artillery uh, Battalion wanted to establish communications with a forward observer to the fire base, okay? Uh, they'd need a line of communications. So what we did there was go to the map and say, well, here's where their headquarters is. Here's where the fire base is. Mm -hmm. Line of sight communications. We'd establish it on a map. And then we'd send it out to the people that were doing it, and they'd set it up. Okay. Now, knowing the geography of Vietnam a little bit, you were basically right at the edge of the mountains, uh, kind of. Nha Trang was right on the ocean. It was right on the South China Sea. Yeah. It was, it was a resort. But you weren't far from the mountains, and I was just wondering how you did a lot of sight in the mountains. Well, no, we did, we did um, communications for the whole country. Okay. Or for the whole two corps. So okay. you were in two core and did, uh, okay. All right. Um, you go to the two highest mountains. Okay. Basically. And if, if, the, if the headquarters was in a low point, they just ran cables to the site. And same thing on the other end. If the fire base was, most of the fire bases were high anyways. They tried to keep them up, yeah. and, you know, hold the high ground. Okay. Uh, All right. So you were living good in Natrang. Tell us about Natrang and, and your lifestyle there and, <laughs> and your first getting there and... And when, so forth. when I got to Nha Trang and, and got off the chopper, um, I had this staff sergeant meet me. Um, 
threw my gear in a, in a Jeep and hauled me to the village and took me to um, a villa with three other NCOs. So an old, an old French villa? An old French villa. Okay. Now, did the village have a name? or Nutrang. Oh, the village of Nutrang itself. Right, so. right. Okay. So uh, a villa with, with three other NCOs. Mm -hmm. um, he said, you know, take a couple of days, get yourself squared away. He says, and then we'll get you going. So a couple of days, walked the beach. Beach was right, out, right, you know, within 100 yards of the villa. Um, when I did start going back and forth to work, there was a Jeep that picked me up every morning, took me to the office, nice air-conditioned building. The end of the day, the Jeep picked me up, took me back to the villa. Had a French lady that did our cooking, or a Vietnamese lady that had been trained by the French, did our cooking for us, our cleaning, and, and uh, basically it was like a nine to five job, but it was actually seven to five, you know. Yeah. But I mean, it was every day back and forth, clean starts, uniform, clean sheets, nice bed. Who'd you make mad? Huh? Who'd you make mad? <laughs> I didn't make anybody mad. They were looking for people to do what I did in Germany. They were looking for people to do rapid deployments. Mm -hmm. So this major was going through 201 files, and as he was going through mine, this flag jumped up. Ah! There's just the guy we're looking for. So they came to the office and said, tomorrow morning, be at the helipad with all your gear. What's going on? Just be at the helipad with all your gear. 8 o'clock, I was at the helipad with all my gear, got on a helicopter. Um, the helicopter took me up to Kantum and, no, I'm sorry, took me to Play Coup. Got off the chopper in Play Coup, and they said, don't go anywhere. Stay here, there's another chopper to come and pick you up. So the second yeah, there chopper... There your chopper. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> the chopper picked me up and took me to Kantum and up in the mountains, and that's where I was for the rest of the year. Uh, Contoon, that was kind of what we call the Central Highlands? Yes, Central Highlands. Um, with the mountain yards, I lived basically a lot with the mountain yards. Okay, uh, for those who don't know, let's talk a little bit about the mountain yards and so forth. They were the mountain people of, of Vietnam. They were the native people of Vietnam, yeah. yeah. Uh, from uh, friends of mine, in fact, uh, Van Pimmy and Raleigh is one of the ones that uh, originally uh, recruited the mountain yards to. Uh, fight for the United States, and probably some of the best allies we've ever had in any place. Yep. Uh, they're still, they're, they're tribes, uh, somewhat like the American engine. The women yep. were uh, basically topless. The men had loincloths and used crossbows and so forth. And yep. uh, was they still somewhat like that when you got there? Oh, yeah. But they also had, they had weapons, American-made weapons. And it was strange to see um, a 14, 15-year-old kid that was maybe... Five foot tall, five foot one tall, carrying an M1 Grand. Yeah, that was one of the yeah. problems that uh, throughout Vietnam, we gave the marching yards and we gave the South Vietnamese, our allies, uh, the old weapons, uh, and to see a Vietnamese uh, walking along with a, a brown automatic rifle that was probably almost twice his height yeah. it was uh, always fun uh, to look at and and so forth. But so the marching yards. Uh, originally, the South Vietnamese government did not want the marching yards to have weapons at all because they had always been so mistreated by the South Vietnamese military or Vietnamese military and, and people that they were afraid if they, we Americans gave the marching yards uh, uh, weapons, they would turn them uh, against them and, and, and so forth. So for a long time, they fought it for a lot. Now, what tribe were you, were, what tribe were you in? I know there's a lot of raid in Dega uh, here in the Wake County area. I, I don't remember any... Uh, Tribal designations, mm -hmm. okay. Um, there's certain things that I guess have just gone away from my memory. Well, you know, some of some of y'all get older and, and, yeah. and memory starts. Yeah, I, I agree 100. Yeah. percent Things start to fade away. Yeah. Uh, uh, they live in. They live in. What? What kind of? How? How did they live? I they mean, lived in. Um, I won't say squalor. They they did a nice job with their with their shelters, but they were basically just bamboo huts with thatched roofs, open sides. Built uh, up off the ground. Off the ground. And they were way up off the ground. Because now, in the why? rainstorms, okay. they would put the livestock under the floor. Okay. Their cattle and their goats. And you'd wake up in the morning sometimes after a rainstorm, and the goats and the chickens would be right up in there with you. you know? uh, we stayed in the mountain yard uh, 
huts a lot. We stayed in their in their hooches a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they always gave us a place to stay. We slept on on like rice mats, you know, rice paper mats. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if there was something going on, if if Charlie was in the area, uh, if they knew that there was something happened, they'd tell us, Didi, Boogie, get out, go someplace, go mm-hmm. hide, go to your, okay. you know, go back to your base camp. Do something. Get away. Charlie's coming. Now, did y'all have uh, someone to cook hot meals? Did you eat off with the mountain yard? Did we you eat, eat, leave, uh, did you eat sea rations or? We lurps? ate a lot of seas, a lot of lerps. Um, we did eat when we were in the villages. If you didn't eat with them, you insulted them. Okay. So you ate off the communal pot. As long as you didn't know it was in the communal pot, it didn't taste too bad. Well, tell tell our uh, viewers here a little bit about the communal communal pot. Well, it would start off as just a basic soup and the kids would walk along and pick up grubs and beetles and bugs and throw them in the pot. Um, If they could scrounge up meat, they didn't waste anything. They didn't waste anything. If they slaughtered a goat, the hooves went (laughs) into it as well as everything else. They'd save the skin for something, but anything that was edible went in the pot. Okay. Um, And edible bit was was kind of... uh, uh, in loose terminology. Yes. Loose terminology. Um, and, again, they wasted nothing. Mm-hmm. They wasted nothing. Uh, they Everything, again, from from the tongue to the tail, everything that was edible went in the pot. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, down south you have this saying that you use everything in a pig but the squeal. Yes. Well, <laughs> it's pretty much the same thing. Yeah. But from what I understand, they use the blood and everything. Oh, yeah. yeah. Made, they, the blood made special soup. They had a drink, I don't know what it was called, but boy, it would definitely knock your socks the, the off. The one you suck through a straw out of this bowl? Out of this, oh, yes. That, uh, uh, they're, they're, um, they're fermented wine or whatever. Yeah, right. it, it's, a uh, rice, it's a rice fermentation, um, and they'd sit around at night, and they had this huge glass bottle like what you see in water fountains mm-hmm. and bubblers, and they'd draw a line on it. Okay, and the line might be that far down from the level, the top level of the of the fluid in there, yeah. and they'd expect you to drink down to that line. I don't, many nights they carried me to the hooches. I'll tell you. Yeah, we uh, uh, many years ago when the uh, last group of the uh, uh, Dega tribe who came to Rotterdam Airport and were staying at uh, Apex, we had dinner with them one night, and uh, I remember that uh, the that uh, wine or whatever it is that hooch they fixed. Uh, it would sneak up and grab you real quick. Oh, yeah. I mean, you were, you were to the point that uh, if you could, the world was starting to rock a little bit before you knew it. That yeah. You weren't really careful. Yeah. There was only one thing that I remember that was even close to it, and that's when I was in Korea. They had something in Korea called makali, and it was pretty close. I mean, it was a rice fermentation. Um, but the one in Korea was just a little more, uh, little more filtered, a little more refined than mm-hmm. the stuff in the yeah. mountains. Now the mountain yards, did they, uh, they were they had their own militia that you work with, or we didn't work with the militia. They worked basically with the special forces okay. and you know the, the special operations groups. Um, so you didn't live directly in the village necessarily. Sometimes, had... sometimes we lived right in the village. We would pitch our tents and you know put up our. Depending if we were within three or four clicks of a mountain yard village, setting up our communications, mm-hmm. we'd stay pretty much with them. Okay. For, okay. for security and right. and for security and, so and and just to be around somebody. When we traveled, we were a six man team, but we always had an infantry platoon with us for security. Right. Um, Sometimes the grunts could get a little unbearable. You mm-hmm. know, they had this superiority complex. Yeah. So we'd we'd spend a lot of time with the arts. It was uh, I won't say it was a good life, but it was fun. I mean, learned a lot. Yeah. It was an experience. My analogy to the whole thing is uh, um, I wouldn't take a million dollars for the experience, but I wouldn't give a dime to do it again. Yeah. All right, tell me now a little bit about here you are in the central highlands right there in the mountains. It's a little cooler than uh, in, down in, uh, uh, in the Delta. Where I was yeah. and down in, so forth. What, uh, tell me what, what your job was there. You did communications again. Right. Uh, you, went out, uh, you went out on patrols and set up... Um, when you went out to set up a communication site, did you uh, did you have uh, infantry or somebody to go with you for security? Yeah, we you always had we had an infantry platoon with us constantly. Um, what would happen usually is is the army engineers or the CBs would clear a spot in the grid. Mm-hmm. Okay, 
Um, it would all be, the logistics would all be done, uh, at, well, at the outfit that I was with in the train. It would all be done there. And we would have our azimuth, you know, and there'd be another team at the other end doing the same thing. And we'd get the communication set up. And again, if it was an artillery unit or infantry unit or whatever kind of unit it was, an armor unit, somebody that, that had a headquarters but needed communications to the front, mm -hmm. they would come in behind us and they would hook into our system. Okay. And they had people that could maintain it. They, had, they didn't have people that could establish it as fast as we could, but they had people that could maintain it. Okay. Now, you go out to a site, the uh, engineers, CBs have cleared out a spot. That way the, the, uh, the bad guys know exactly where you are yep. because it's a nice, clear spot. Yeah. And you got infantry guys out there. Uh, I, you pitch tents and... Uh... Sometimes. Sometimes. Sometimes we just threw things out on the ground and slept on the ground. That's okay. all these little white marks. Yeah, with leeches. The... With the bugs and the leeches yeah. and the snakes and, <laughs> and all that all that good stuff that grew up in yeah. uh, in Vietnam. Uh, now, when you were out and you were setting up these communications, uh, uh, the North Vietnamese guys they, they weren't particularly happy about setting up communications. And you know, in in the time that I was over there, I think we only got probed about four times while we were setting up, mm -hmm. and probed. I mean, no all-out attacks. Um, we we were more in danger in the mountain yard villages than we were out on our sites. Uh, we'd get night probes. You know, they they uh, send somebody up close to the wire and throw a grenade, or they dump a couple of mortars in, or something. But nothing really heavy. Mm -hmm. um, most of the firefights I say were close to the mountain yard villages when we were doing a stand down, or we were moving from one point to another. We yeah. didn't walk much. Yeah. We we. Uh, when we were going from mountaintop to mountaintop, the choppers would take us because we had all of our equipment to yeah. take with us, too. Oh, you missed a lot of fun that way. Oh, I know. Um, <laughs> um, let's, what year was this? I was there all of 69. I got there in January. So it was after, after the Tet Offense. Oh, yeah. Okay. When I got there, they were afraid that it was going to happen again, and everything yeah. was was in high alert. Uh in anticipation that they were going to do another in Tet January, Offensive. You were in the train about the time for Right. They were getting, getting ready. They were in anticipation of another Tet Offensive mm -hmm. that never happened. But uh, being that it had happened at that time the year before, they were everything was high alert. Now, how long were you usually on site? Uh, did it vary or is it? Usually, usually no more than three days. Okay. And then we'd get picked up. But we never, well, I won't say never, we very seldom got back to, to base camp to stand down. It was going from one point to another. Okay. okay? Um, we, would, we would get our orders on the fly. We would get our, our sight grids on the fly. And we'd get on the choppers and take us there. And when we got there, they had all these big Sikorsky cranes. Remember the flying cranes? Yeah. They'd bring in the gear, set the, the cubes down, the, the, you know, the hooches, the communications hooches, mm -hmm. set down all the antenna uh, gear, and we'd go to work. How high was one of those antennas that you put up? And Depending on the canopy, anywhere from 30 to 80 feet. Okay. Uh, and you all had to set the antennas up, fix them so they didn't fall? Yeah, uh, yeah and, they uh, were all the, all guy-wired, and depending on the height, the number of guy-wires. Mm -hmm. uh, if it was an 80-foot antenna, there were usually six, six levels of guy-wires all, you know, spread out. Um, Did you have to... what? Did you have to have some kind of power? Uh, would you use generators or what, what was they, the power? The, the generators would come in with the equipment. Okay. Okay. Um, and we would, who manned them when you left? The outfit that we set everything okay. up for. So if you were out with the 9th Infantry or whatever, or like I was down, down where I was, then they would man it. They had their own running. mechanics and their own communications people that would come in and man the site. Okay. All right. All, right. All we did was basically set things up. Establish communications with the distant point, and then move on. And boogie. Okay, so you just uh, when you were flying to the next spot, they just kind of resupplied you as you yep. as you were needing when you yep. got there and so forth. Yep. And then maybe six weeks, eight weeks, two weeks, three weeks, they'd say, "Remember that place you put up on that grid? Go take it down." Okay. Now what? Where did you? Uh, where? And if you were going from uh, out at the boonies, from the boonie to boonie. Where did you do things like uh, take showers and uh, <laughs> and, uh, 
and get hot meals and uh, hot meals. Hot meals were done in a helmet. Sea rations. Okay. Okay. Showers were out of a helmet from the streams. Okay. Uh, Clean clothes, fresh uniforms, where every time we got back to base camp, we used to have to go threaten a, a quartermaster sergeant to get clean uniforms and boots and underwear and all necessities because for some reason those quartermaster guys thought that all that stuff belonged to them. Yeah, you know? they always did. That's the reason I mentioned a while ago. It sometimes it was easy to get things on the black market, yeah. a uniform or whatever, and it was to go through the supply sergeant. We would go out and maybe have, we'd have four uniforms in our rucksack, okay? And over the period of time that we were in the bush, those four uniforms would just rot. They'd shred. Yeah. You know, you, I mean, uh, you can only wash things in the stream so many times, and you can only sweat for days at a time in one uniform. It gets to be pretty ripe, and when you take it off, it starts to disintegrate. It starts yeah. to fall apart. You know? yeah. Boots. Boots would rot on our feet. Yeah. You know? I know down in the Delphi area, they would uh, uh, dry rot, or you'd be wet so often. Not between, not necessarily just from the sweat, which you were always wet on, right. but uh, uh, the creeks and so forth. So it never really got dry. And the, the we didn't and have to do much fording. Um, uh, luckily, we didn't have to walk through some of those chin yeah. deep uh, streams and, and whatnot that the guys in the Delta did. Um, if we had to ford anything, if we had to cross a stream, it was never much deeper than knee deep. Yeah. You know? Okay. Um, the one thing I will say is the, the, the design of the, the jungle fatigues, whoever designed them, did a hell of a job because you'd sweat, and after you sweat, you'd be cool because it would rapid evaporate and it would cool you off. Yeah, I remember I never wore a poncho because I sweated more with a poncho on than yeah. I did without it. I just, you know, for the first 15 to 30 minutes, the rain felt good, but yep. then you got cold. But yep. uh, would start with, but I found that wearing the poncho was was worse than uh, getting in the rain. So. Oh yeah, I, I don't think I think I unrolled my poncho for a ground cloth. I don't think I ever threw it over my shoulders. Yeah. All right, now you're in Vietnam in 1960. When did you come home? January 70. No, or? I came home just before Christmas of '69. We got okay. a dispensation. Um, they had something they did that year. I don't know what. There was a name for it, but if you had less than than 10 days or less than 15 days or whatever it was and it was before christmas they got you home i was home i got home christmas eve huh. you got you didn't miss christmas no uh, matthews and i missed he, he's he's been writing a book for years now we miss christmas and no uh, i didn't I miss remember, christmas I, I never i missed thanksgiving and easter and birthdays and watching my kid grow up and you know uh, when I left, my kid was um, 18 months old. When I got home, she was three years old, going on 30. You know. Yeah. All right. Now you. What are you? Now you're still in the military. Yeah. Uh, and you're brought back to stateside. Where did you go stateside when you came back? Fort to, Riley, Kansas. Fort Riley, Kansas. Okay. Yeah. Um, and is the, your family join you there? Yeah. Okay. Yep. I lived in government quarters again. And by then, I was an E6. I had made staff sergeant in Vietnam. Okay. Um. I never worked communications again. Never worked communications. I basically um, was a doer of anything they wanted me to do. Doing in the summertime when the ROTC people were there, I led convoys. I took the ROTC people out to their training sites. And, well, um, I found that, and when in the, in the, in the late '69s and the '70s, there were so many of. Uh, E fives and E six coming back. They had a hard time figuring out what to do with them. Yeah, and it was kind of uh, make work. It was kind. Of, it's kind of like when you went first went in the army. It was make work. You dig a ditch and then come back. Somebody else can fill the ditch up and you move to another one. And they come and vice versa. Yeah, and it was almost that way when you came back uh, in Kansas. So. Well, Fort Riley was um, uh, was an infantry center. The the twenty fifth was there. Mm -hmm. And they the summer camps for the ROTC people. They were basically learning infantry tactics and whatnot. So uh, my job in the summertime when they were there was basically to get the convoys from point A to point B, mm -hmm. right? Uh, make sure that the drivers were all there in the morning, the trucks were all in good shape, and um, we'd go to the, the barracks area where the ROTC people were and load them up, haul them out to the bush and dump them off and hang around for the day, right? not do much of anything. Uh, by the way, if you want to ask Ange a question, give us a call, 919-518-9773, uh, and ask him a question about uh, 
uh, installing uh, radio equipment or what else about, uh, about his year in, in Korea or his year in uh, Germany or, or the Montagnards. If you have a question about the Montagnards, I'd be, I'm certainly be glad to answer that. Okay, now we're back to Kansas. Um, I went through, oh, I don't know how many different leadership schools um, prepping for E7. Okay. I went to D.C. for a couple of their uh, uh, promotion seminars. I, was, I don't know how many different schools I went to. And was by the time I got out of the service, and uh, there's two reasons that I got out, and we'll go into one of them, but we won't go into the other. Okay. Um, I was, like, number 240 on the D.A. list for E7, okay, which means that I was up there pretty good. Um, when I got ready to re-enlist, which was, you know, real quick time, um, I asked the sergeant major of the battalion I was in to see if he could find out where I was going. Being an E6, you, you know, you have some rapport with the senior NCOs. Mm -hmm. And I said, if, find out where I'm going to go if I re-enlist. You know, do I get a choice or am I just throwing myself into the pool? He says, I'll see what I can do. And he come back about a week later, and he said, they're going to send you back to the jungle. Uh -uh. I says, type up to 214. I says, I'm not re-enlisted. I'm out. Biggest mistake I ever made. I should have stayed and done my 20 years, because I had been in for six. You know. Um, and just uh, that was one of the reasons I say the other one we won't go into. Well, uh, very going delicate. Back, going, going back to the jungles, you would probably been E7. And you probably wouldn't have. You probably may end up in trying at that same, yeah, uh, yeah. That same villa. I so. thought about that afterwards. You know, I said, being an E seven, I never saw that many E sevens in the bush. Yeah. You know, unless they were grunts. You know, uh, most of the E sevens in in uh, again in logistics were mm -hmm. basically back. And I thought about that afterwards, and I thought about going back in. And uh, the year that I got out. I got out in April of, of 71 uh, from when I got out until uh, like mid-September was probably the worst four or five months of my life. Okay, I got out of the Army April 4th. My grandfather died April 21st. Mm. My father died August 12th. Um, my wife decided right after Labor Day she didn't want to be married anymore. Mm -hmm. So my whole world just imploded, you know. Um, I took... Two years, I got on my motorcycle and I rode all over the country for two years, just from one job to another, from one town to another, north, south, up and down the west coast, from Mexico to Canada, uh, back and forth across the south. You know, for two years I did that on, on the west coast. Now, so so you went as far away from New York as you could get, just without a doubt. Yeah, I was uh, from from the Baja all the way up to Vancouver. Uh, you know, uh, up and down what is that Highway One that goes up and down the coast of California. So for, for two years, uh, two so years. you just kind of uh, just bummed. Uh, basically, a homeless guy yep. going out and, and working, working to get enough money to put gas in the in the bike and yep. some food and hit the road again. Yep, and I did everything from short order cooking to picking lettuce to working in the gas platforms in Baja. Uh, worked in a lumber camp in Canada. You know, did a little bit of everything for two years. Um, then decided it was time to head back east. And I got back in October of '73. And just before Thanksgiving, I met the lady that I spent the next 34 years with. Um, went to work, worked for a guy out of Rochester that was, if all bosses were like John, there'd be no labor problems any place in this country. Fantastic job. What was it you're doing? I, we installed factories. We built factories. Okay. Okay, we installed the uh, heavy manufacturing Using systems. Using some of the skills that you learned with your dad. Yeah, very little of what I learned with my dad. Uh, most of it was the first 90 days of working with John's crews was learning the heavy stuff. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, again, we'd walk into a, an empty building, and when we walked out two or three or four months later, it was an operating factory. You know? um, doing everything from prepping food to textiles to uh, even in the chemical industries. So you, you know? travel with that one? Oh, also. all over the country, yeah, all yeah. over the country. 
we we'd be gone. It was the longest job we were gone was six months. We were in New Mexico for six months on a job. But normally we'd be gone three or four weeks, five weeks. Um, if we were going to be gone more than two months, um, John would set up after the first month. We could expect in the mail first class tickets to go home for the weekend. Right, leave Friday, come back Monday, mm -hmm. first class. Yeah. How Just, how old were you along about this time now? How old was yeah. I? Well, I see. I was uh, when I got out of the service in seventy one. I was twenty nine. Okay. And by the time I started working for John, I was in my early thirties. Okay. All right. So you're still still a pretty young guy. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, did uh, a lot of crazy things. I rode with motorcycle clubs for uh, quite a few years. Uh, lived inside of a bottle of Jack Daniels for too long. Is that going back to? Uh, the Vietnam experience, yeah. or the, yeah. all the problems of coming home from no, Vietnam? No, it started. Or? It started in Vietnam. Okay, it started in Vietnam. It, it exacerbated when I got home after, yeah. you know, all the the bad stuff happened within that four month period. Um, again, uh, I just basically my world just collapsed. You know. Well, obviously you beat that because you're here. Uh, yeah. At the, at, the, uh, at the rate you were going, you probably wouldn't be here. So. Right. Well, the lady that I met, the lady that I met in, in 73 um, was a widow. Her husband was killed in Vietnam. She had a son that was 10 years old, and she was my savior. Mm -hmm. Okay, She stuck with me through things that um, a weaker woman wouldn't have been able to handle. Okay. She, uh, she put up with my nightmares. She put up with my drinking. She put up with uh, not... Physical abuse, but I browbeat the hell out of her a lot of times. You know, uh, I'd be gone, I'd be be home for you know, be on a on a home stand we call it, uh, for three or four weeks, and I'd take off on a Friday night and I'd come back till Sunday, Monday. I had a buddy we used to ride down to New York and party with the Hell's Angels in, in South Bronx, you know, um, and never call her, never tell her where I was going, what I was doing, who I was doing it with. And she just stuck with me through all of it. Um, but the, the nice thing about it was is that if I'd be gone for a long period of time, and when we got back, when I come back home, it was like a honeymoon. I mean, we just, you know, it was like meeting all over again. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, we traveled a lot together. We did, uh, we did some really neat things together. We went to Hawaii a couple of times. Uh, we went to Aruba a couple of times. We ever heard of the Trans-Canada Railway trip? Yep. Did that twice. Just on a spur, we'd say, let's do this. Yeah. And I was making fantastic money. I mean, but when I was forced into retirement in 2000, when I got hurt, uh, I was making almost 50 bucks an hour. You know? So I was making good money. Mm -hmm. And my five-year plan was that at age 60, I was we were going to stop doing all the, the foolish stuff with the money. Going to live on her paycheck, put mine away, so we'd have some money in retirement. Well, I got hurt. In 2000, and that that just shut my work off. I couldn't work anymore after that. How did you end up in Raleigh, North Carolina? I used to travel to see my mom who lives in Bradenton, and I used to drive through, um, drive down 95, and every once in a while I would pick North Carolina to stop. It was the halfway point. So I, you know, just the area I'd pick Raleigh or Durham and, you know, just stay in a hotel for a couple of days on the way down and on the way back. And I just sort of really liked Raleigh. I thought it was a neat place. Um, it was quiet. There wasn't a whole hell of a lot going on here that was bad. Being the state capital, the police force was probably more intense than other places. And it was close to Durham, to the hospital, because all my care is through VA. And when I decided that it was time to leave the north, this is where I wanted to come. Mm -hmm. So, and I've been here, I got here in, in uh, January of 2010, and I've been here ever since, and I'm not going anywhere. Okay. And as I've told you numerous times, a lot of people come down here from the north and want to bring the north down here with them. I came down here from the north to leave it up there. Okay. All right. um, I want to assimilate the life down here. You know, it's comfortable. Uh, I know that uh, for those of you uh, watching, uh, Ange uh, 
first of all, I mentioned something about I was going back to Vietnam, and I got this ain't no way uh, and a lot of other things which I won't mention right now. But uh, uh, as we got closer and closer and started working with the local Vietnamese and raising money and so forth, uh, he started to uh, participating with helping us raise money, uh, going to more and more functions. And when we said, okay, it's time to make a decision, those are going to Vietnam. And he uh, ended up his uh, money to, for the initial uh, trip to Vietnam. I was a little shocked because he was probably about as anti going to Vietnam as anybody had ever met. And uh, I think up until the day he got on the airplane, uh, it wouldn't have taken much for him to uh, said, okay, uh, I'll just, uh, I'll, you know, uh, I think the, the fact that $4,000 out of his own pocket also had something to the fact that he didn't back out. He didn't want to lose all that money. And uh, you, got I, on, you got on that airplane. I think um, from the gate at Raleigh-Durham Airport that there's still two furrows where you guys drugged me and my heels were dragging. <laughs> um, got on the plane, and I was apprehensive until I saw that first smile. Now, when you landed, in, give me your thoughts when uh, the first time you landed the train, uh, and you landed this time in Da Nang, and uh, the airports have changed a little bit. Apples uh, and oranges. Yes, uh, or, or uh, apple apples and, and raisins, just apples, about yeah. as, as, uh, as much as it changed. Um, that, uh, when I got when we got off that plane in Da Nang, and I looked around at that airport. Now, I was never in Da Nang when I was in country. Yeah. Me either, so. um, but I had talked to Marines that had been up there, and um, when I saw that airport, this is in Vietnam, this is any city USA, you know, and it sort of lightened my apprehension a little bit. And the smells weren't there. Oh, <laughs> without a doubt, and good smells were there. Uh, and that's that's one that's surprising is is lack of smells of mosquitoes. Yeah, yeah, there were good smells in the airport. Yeah. You know? And when, you know, the first few days, the, the sandy beach was unbelievable. I didn't, of course, when I was in the train, the train was like that. Mm -hmm. But um, I didn't know there was any place else in Vietnam like that. And I'm sure that that has established since the conflict. Oh, yes. Um, just being there and seeing that and, and the conditions of the place. And then when we got into 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 Dong Ha and went to the orphanage and those kids were waiting to greet us, it just washed everything away. Yeah. It just washed everything away. All the apprehension Dong Ha was almost like going back to uh, the old Vietnam. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. We stayed in when we stayed in uh, right outside of Da Nang, uh, right up the road from Marble Mountain. Uh, Sandy Beach was a very very nice resort, uh, but when you get to Dong Ha. Uh, the only reason to go to Dong Ha is basically if you're going somewhere else or building a playground. Yeah. yeah. And they told what uh, Mr. Song said that the hotel we stayed in was the best hotel in, in Dong Ha. And it was, for those of you who travel, it was the bottom end of Motel 6. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, now when we're in Vietnam, uh, in, in the train, and we went to, we, we worked hard, uh, and the heat about got all of us from time to time. We worked hard. But uh, we did get a chance to go to the beach uh, a couple times, and uh, well, one time I guess. Yeah. I uh, we went to the beach. Uh, uh, Song is a super guy, but his his sense of direction See, or direction time. time yeah. He says just ten minutes from from the orphanage. And An hour like, and a half later. Yeah, you know, we're at this <laughs> beach, and uh, obviously, uh, it was and for some time or another, it's a really nice beach because they got all these. Uh, places for people to party and so forth. It's yeah. kind of like going to North Carolina beaches in the winter time. Yeah. Uh, but then you realize the Vietnamese people don't like sunshine. Now it's hard to believe somebody lives in Vietnam and don't like sunshine. They come out late in the afternoon and when the sun's kind of uh, gone down. Or yeah. it was always amazing to me, even as many times I've been back, is to see people going down the road. We're we're dying from the heat and they're wearing jackets. Yeah, women, women wearing face masks, hats, jackets, gloves. It's 100 degrees out, and they're all dressed up like it's 30 degrees yeah. you know, because they don't want to get the sun on them. Yeah. But as soon as the sun goes down, like Bill said, everything opens up. You know, it just becomes, the cities become just one big party. I remember seeing rice drying uh, back during the war, but I hadn't seen rice drying in the middle of the highway. No. 
that was a little surprising for me. You know, you're going down the road and they've taken the rice out of the field and just spread along the highway and cars just kind of go around a little bit and the bicycles and the kids and the chickens kind of... Uh, chickens are pecking the around. Yeah, <laughs> and the rice is... Um, uh, that brown rice is laying there on the ground in towns. It's, that was kind of surprising. Yeah, I don't uh, remember that uh, when I was over yeah, there. I remember seeing rice drying out on a patio or something. But right. not, 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 not on the road. The street, not out on yeah. the road, yeah. Uh, so you're over there, and uh, it's hot, but and the heat's about the same. Uh, maybe a little hotter, because I think for some for some reason I remember that I remember being hot, but I don't remember as hot as I was uh, that darn hot. That well, was, like, like you said... Um, where, where I was in the Highlands, it was probably, well, anywhere from 5 to 15 degrees cooler up there than it was yeah. in the valleys, okay? Um, Dong Ha was oppressive. Oh, yes. It was And oppressive. it was a lot cooler than being down in Saigon, yeah. I can tell you. Uh, Just, uh, I mean, you're in a in a, uh, a compound, the temperature is 102 degrees, and there's no air movement. It's just dead still, so there's... Nothing moving along to cool you off in any way. How, many, how much water did we get? How many gallons of water? I don't know uh, how many bottles of water we each one drank a day. Yeah. And uh, we basically, when we were there, we ate, at two, we ate one restaurant every day for lunch. We ate another restaurant in the evening. And they kind of, uh, it's like they all use the same menu sometimes. It's yeah. uh, Well, the food was not, uh, I wasn't impressed with the food. Okay. Well, it's when you leave when you leave Sandy Beach and you get the, you go to this buffet that's got just about anything you yeah. want it, and then you go there and you got squid that you have to take the beak out, and then I remember the day that we got chicken, and the passed you to play the chicken and the and the chicken was looking at you, and I, the, I took that plate and I saw that head there and I said, nah, no chicken for me, and I just passed the plate. The beak and the head, the eyes, and everything was just laying there. And they did, and even had a little bit of pin feathers on it. So it's, yeah. uh, and they don't, and again, they don't waste anything. The feet, everything yeah. were in that plate. Yeah. I, I don't know what they do with the feathers, but I'm sure they do something with it. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who are watching, uh, the next ceremony we have will be August uh, 2nd. It will be... Uh, the Purple Heart, uh, the ro the Order of the Purple Hearts will be doing our uh, normal first month uh, POWMIA ceremony. Uh, Angie and I and a couple others, Bob, uh, my co-host, uh, and I with uh, and Joe Harsh will be going down to Wilson Friday night to set up the wall. So if you're in the Wilson area or know someone that's in the Wilson area, invite them to come over. We have, as you've probably heard before, if you've seen the show, a one-eighth replica of the Vietnam Wall. We have the printer uh, and a computer, with which we can look up uh, bios of the people that are on the wall. Uh, we will be there from, uh, well, 9 o'clock officially Saturday morning. The opening ceremony is going to be at 10. Uh, we'll be going there for a good part of the day. Stop by and see us. Uh, the next show is the 23rd. And on the 23rd, uh, we're going to be changing times again. We're going to go back for the 8 to 9 slot uh, with it being summertime. I know all of y'all got things to do because the sun's shining, and uh, it gives us a little bit more time, too. Uh, I still work for a living uh, every now and then. Uh, <laughs> with last Friday, we were at the uh, state capitol with the wall and had a good turnout for the 4th of July. We were right back there on the 5th to do the ceremony again. So uh, join us on the 23rd. Hopefully Wayne is doing uh, better health-wise. We can have him to come in. But it will be between 8 and 9 o'clock, uh, instead of the 7 8 o'clock hour. And what I want to do right now is if we could watch that. Uh, 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 I guess you need to tell them what's the date that you're going to be in Wilson. You know it. Uh, the 12th of July uh, is the date we're going to be in Wilson. I forgot this. It gets archived. Uh, so uh, t 12th of July, which is this coming uh, uh, Saturday, we will be in Wilson at uh, American Legion Post 13, which is out on 301 Highway. Those of you who know the area, it's across from Parker's Barbecue, but it's at the State Fair at the, the uh, Wilson County Fairgrounds. So come join us there, uh, July 12th, August uh, 2nd. It was the POW service. Uh, the next show will be the 23rd of July. Uh, for eight to nine o'clock hour. Um, you got anything else you want to say? I want to uh, show the uh, the uh, slide series and let you comment about 
the slide series that, that we're getting ready to show because most of it's uh, about your, your part of the trip. So okay. as you see it on the uh, monitor there, uh, just kind of give a uh, comment and so forth. Uh, the pictures, you probably recognize most of the pictures. Uh, I think that's us in Seoul. It's in so the Seoul Airport, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, those are the bungalows at Sandy Beach. Right beyond the ocean? That's the restaurant at Sandy Beach, uh, the breakfast buffet. Um, just a little shy of Golden Corral, but not much. That's the silk factory in Hoi An. And Song. And Mr. Song. Yep, that was our guide. Yeah. It was uh, our former Arvin soldier. Uh, when he was 16, he, when the Marines landed on Red Beach, he was there holding up a sign going, Welcome to the United States Marines. Yep. And, uh, yeah, he was, uh, he was a junior officer in the Air Force. Yeah. yeah. And had to go through a couple of years in a re-education camp. Well, you'll notice from these pictures, we did a lot of eating when we were there. Yeah, uh, this was in Hoi An on the uh, at the on the river. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah. And that was having dinner. Yeah. Uh, let's see. When you were at Hoi An, you did something kind of special there. I had a suit made. Uh, you had the a silk suit, custom made at the silk factory. At the silk yeah. factory. Okay. Yeah. Um, the the comparison will say between what I had done there and. What you would have done here, it cost me $450 to get fitted for the suit in the morning and have it delivered at dinner time. And in the States, it would cost you anywhere from 2000 to 2500 bucks. Hand, 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 handmade, handmade. You got measured about 10 o'clock, and, and I would say about 6 o'clock. Yep. Delivered uh, at dinner they, time. They come for your final fitting and, and gave you the suit. Yep. That's not bad. Not bad at all. All right. Uh, Okay, that's um, okay. That's the the, shipping, the, box. the shipping boxes, um, and next to it is part of the playground being laid out, getting ready to assemble. Uh, that was the the initial assembly, the A frame to, and everything was built off of that. that you notice was, we're finding a little bit of shade there. Yeah, yeah, any shade's better than what we had. Yeah, that is the complete playground almost complete you you were holding up the uh the, the hurricane slide there oh okay so yeah. we can fix it. put the put the base underneath it yeah, yeah. that's me with uh, one of the little girls um i think that had to be the first day that's yeah that's the school in the high school in dong ha mm -hmm. um, we carried packages from local students uh to the kids there in dong ha right we uh we gave all the kids uh, a package uh, had from kids here and it had pictures and little biographies and email addresses. And um, from what I understand, the emails were flying before we left. That was us doing the show from the from Oh, the okay. I, that's kind of small. I was having a hard time seeing it. Yeah, that's the patio, uh, the, the patio at the uh, where the playground is. Yeah, in order for us to do the show at uh, 7 o'clock on Wednesday night, we had to be there at 530 Thursday morning to do a seven o'clock show here, yeah. and the kids have been on the playground since four. Yep, yeah. yep. Um, that one is. This is one of the places we're eating. Oh yeah, that's, that's, you, that's you and some of the waitresses. Yep, that's the restaurant. Um, the up, upstairs. Uh, at Dong Ha. Yeah, at Dong Ha. Yeah, that's yeah. where we ate dinner every night. Yep. Yeah. And one we just had was you and uh, you sitting with the with the whatever the clown or whatever that was at uh, oh in, the in the Wade, bear I that was way the bear, the bear yeah. in Wade, the, at, the, at the shopping mall yeah. at the Walmart of Way yeah that was Kason yeah. yeah that was Kason that's the um, uh, coffee plantation and some of the debris they captured for the um, yeah and that was a group picture at the at first the orphanage. First orphanage where they had uh, yeah. I didn't go to that one I wasn't there when they built it but uh, went, I did go here. And, and, and saw um, the sisters. That's us eating. Oh, that's uh, in North North Vietnam. North Vietnam. That yep. was a, one of our meals uh, just north of uh, in, in North Vietnam, just north of the DMZ, yep. which we thought was one of our best. I was going to say meals. that was the best meal we had. Um, now Santa that Beach. is uh, that Lang Col. Not Sandy Beach. That's Lang Col. Lang Col. Yeah. That's the the resort we stayed at the last two or three days we were there, and it was. Um, as good as Sandy Beach, if not better in some ways. Um, the food wasn't as good for breakfast, but everything else was was five star. Yeah. And that was that was uh, kind of uh, Ange's trip back to Vietnam and so forth. And uh, Ange, we're talking about uh, in another year or two putting together another trip. Uh, you thinking about you might go back again? 
If we don't have to build a playground, yeah. Uh, well, uh, we talk to playground people, and if we go uh, later in the year, so it's not past their big thing, they'd like to go back and work on the playground, and then we can go uh, kind of... Uh, be tourists. Be tourists a little bit. And one of the things we talked about doing, the kids at that orphanage, other than going to school, they never left that compound. Yeah. And the beach is only about an hour away, depending on songs directions. <laughs> maybe we could take the kids to either to uh, a busload of them to the beach or to way. a half a day trip to go to the way because they've never seen. Take them to one of those country. stores and let them go shop. Uh, yeah. So that would be a good th- sideline for us. And uh, we have talked about it, but it's it takes me a... I don't even like to ride by the airport now and see an airplane fly over. I've had I, all the airplanes. I had before. to take somebody to the airport the other day and I closed my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 when you spend that much time in an airport or in an airplane, it's and we it, had it's tough. how much how much airport time did we have? Well, the time? whole th- whole trip that back was like thirty hours, yeah. and a lot of it was airport time. Uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, it was over ten hours of it was airport time. Yeah, uh, so so forth. But well, that's our show this time. Uh, again, we'll be in Wilson the twelfth with the wall. Uh, we'll be back here on the twenty third with the new hours of eight to nine. Uh, Bob will be back with us before too much longer. We have a POW ceremony on August the 2nd, 12 o'clock noon at the state capitol. Uh, give us a call at 919-518-9773. Write that down so you have it for the next show. Uh, thank you for tuning in with us and looking forward to uh, visiting with you on our next trip uh, on the 23rd of July. And thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. I enjoyed it very much yes, sir. and I hope some of the things I said were information Good. We're through. or informative I you are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Amnon Nissan Health In with Debbie Brooke, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Lessons of Vietnam with NCVVI members, The Tanya Love Show, Reawaken Your Brilliance with Julie Seibert, and if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com. Sponsored by Atomus.com makers of quality video recorders and converters for professionals. That vidblasterguy.com, carolinaapparel.com, and deltaforce.net.